We've just sung that song about being a friend to Jesus. You know, there's a lot involved in that. And there's lessons we could do about that, sermons that we have done in the past about that. But Jesus knows who our, uh, who our friends are and he knows who his friends are. And that's why we need to be very careful about that and to prove he is our friend by truly trusting in him and following him and doing his will. This morning I want to talk about for the few moments of time that we have, talk about our adversary a little bit. As we often are reminded, like last Sunday, we talked about temptations. But here I want to talk about some that we may never have considered when Satan comes to services. And this is something that we may never think about in this sense, that Jesus wants us to do what's right. But Satan often does wants us to do what's wrong. And that's why he is in the back, uh, back in the background, trying to do what he can to disrupt whatever he can from happening that's good and right in our lives. Our lesson text is taken from Job chapter one, verses six to twelve. Before I begin, I know you may notice the graphic there. You, know, you ever thought about what is your view of Satan? And I know there's pictured as a person who's in red, having a pitchfork, maybe with pointy ears and a barbed tail and such. That's not the biblical picture of Satan. I want to tell you that right now. I try to steer away mainly from that picture. But that's the world's view of what Satan is about. That's why I use that at least in a silhouette to kind of show that we do have an adversary. We picture him many times in that picture because of, because of artists in that way. Take your Bibles to Job chapter 1 once again. I want to read these passages one more time as we look at it. Brother Fred done a wonderful job reading these passages, but I want to make some application to what is said here. Here in Job chapter 1, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now I'll stop right there. We don't know exactly what this setting was. And the, and the only thing we really truly know is that people of God were doing things, presenting themselves before God. And then Satan comes along there and does it, whether it's in heaven itself or on the earth. And that's somewhat unclear in some ways. And I know some have tried to say, what well, was Satan in heaven? And again, we don't know all the context of this. We do know Satan came and made his presence known when people of God were doing what they're doing and presenting themselves before God. And the Bible goes on to say in verse 7, The Lord said to Satan, Where do you come? Where do you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil? And Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a, a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all he that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do, do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan depart from the presence of the Lord. And so we see our lesson today. Can Satan be among the people of God today? And let's look at some of the things the Bible says about Satan's work as he is trying to do what he does among God's people. We know what he does in the world. That's pretty much the lesson last week. And, and we still, again, as God's people, fight temptations and such. Let's look at some of the other things that Satan does to criticize God's people. If you're still there in the book of Job, Job chapter 2 actually goes over this again. It's the same scenario that we saw in chapter 1. Again, the Bible tells us, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. And still he still holds fast to his integrity, although you entice me against him, destroy him without cause. In other words, this is after 
Job had lost all his stuff, his possessions, his sons and daughters that were killed in the storm, and his wife told him to, to curse God and die in this particular chapter before that actually happens here. But again, in chapter 2, it seems like the same words. Have you considered Job, my servant? Verse 4, here's the difference. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. In other words, you don't kill Job, but you, you spare his life. And that's what exactly what it does. Exactly what the devil does. He goes on and gives him sores from the top of his head down to the bottom of his feet. And here he's suffering in agony because of what the devil's doing in his life. And so there's an attack here. But no, this is simply par for the course when it comes to Satan. Because that's exactly what his job is. His pattern of behavior. In Revelation chapter 12 verse 10, the Bible tells us here in the book of Revelation, John says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser. Here's what he's talking about, Satan. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. He's referring to the fact that Satan lost in this battle. And Satan is, the, you might say, the ultimate loser when it comes to the idea of not ever being victorious over God and his people. But, you know, he wants to criticize he wants to accuse you and I even today, I believe. Because that's not something that was only for the Old Testament. Now, Satan's different. No, Satan still is going to act like Satan. He's going to continue to criticize God's people even now. And I believe that's one of the reasons why the one of the works of the flesh, the idea of slander and speech that goes against the other people, like in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Take your Bible and turn over there, if you will. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Here the Bible tells us about how that we're not to be a part of this. And I'll tell you why. Because we're never more like Satan doing his work than when we are acting just like him in this regard. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. Here the Bible says in verse 3, if anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the doctrine conforming to godliness. Now, if people don't agree, and we see this all the time, people come to services sometimes with different doctrines and ideas and opinions about things. Notice what he says in verse 4. He is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and depraved of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. It's read on verse 6. You know what he's telling us here? Don't be like Satan, because he's the critical one. And he is the one that slanders people. People are trying to do right. People are trying to live like Job in that sense. Well, that's exactly what his job is. There's times in the Bible when God's people have been criticized. And we understand what that means. There's times when Moses, in Numbers chapter 12, when he took an Ethiopian woman to be his wife. It was when Miriam and Aaron both criticized him in verses 1 through 10. And actually they were, had received some consequences because of that. They actually were punished by God for their going against and speaking against Moses and criticizing him because of that. Then in, when it comes to Jesus, in Matthew chapter 11, the Bible speaks about there how people criticized him. You know, he was probably the one who was the most criticized. When Jesus came to this earth in Matthew chapter 11, I want to read verses 18 and 19. And we'll see how our Lord dealt with this. You know, he had to deal with this on a constant basis. In verse 18, the Bible says, Here, 
He says, for John neither came eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Basically, Jesus is telling these Jews this. You know, you're not happy either way. John came uh, eating and drinking. Actually, came not eating and drinking. And you said he has a demon. But I came eating and drinking. And you say he's a gluttonous man and a friend of sinners. In other words, whichever way you go, you're wrong in the eyes of those who want to criticize you. You know, the devil's the same way when it comes to us. There's times when he says, oh, you're not smart enough. You're not good enough to be a Christian. You've done all kinds of bad things. You can never to measure up to anything. All kinds of, of negativity. You know, the devil is the king of, of negativity. You know why? Because he wants to discourage us. He wants us to make us feel less than who we really can be in Christ and in God. And in chapter 12, again, they criticized him and said, you've cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub. No, it can't be God that's helping you. You know, they would say anything about Jesus because they did not want to accept him. They did not like Jesus. Oftentimes it's your enemies who are the most critical of you. That's We see that with Jesus, that they were most critical of him while he was here on this earth. And Paul faced, there's many times we can look at the life of Paul. Some slanderously said that he had done evil that good may come as what, the Bible says. But here in Acts 27, when he had brought some Gentiles into the worship where the Jews were in the temple. Now some came later try to accuse him falsely of doing more than that, trying to destroy everything. You know, Paul had not, was not trying to destroy the worship of the Jews. But he was actually trying to teach them the ways to bring them to Christ where his true worship is and service to God. Now the question comes, how do we handle criticism? Take your Bible over to 1 Peter chapter 3 and you'll see what Peter says about this. That it's interesting that we need to know how to handle this. Because there's times when criticism will come. I think no one is immune to it. We all have to face the voice of the critic from time to time. Whether it's right or just or not. In verse 14, here Peter says... But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, with, yet with gentleness and reverence. Now, you don't overreact to criticism and such. Verse 16, and keep a, a good conscience. So that in the thing in which you are slandered, in other words, that word slandered, the New American Standard uses the word slandered, reviled and such. You know, basically they're saying things about you there. Go on to say, those who revile you for your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. <clears throat> now how does that happen? Well, one day all God's people will be vindicated. Moses will be vindicated among the people because he was a right man. He was a just man. He was the meekest on the face of Jesus especially, we know will be vindicated before all the world that he truly was the Son of God and that he is the one we follow today. And even Paul, Paul had the best of intentions and was sincere about what he was trying to do in service to God. And yet he was criticized for that, even by some brethren saying, well, he's weak in person. He's not able to really stand. That's what some said at Corinth about that. In First and Second Corinthians as well. You know what Satan tries to do? Not only that, he tries to distract our minds from worship. We're here together. We're here for a purpose, aren't we? We're here to try our to the best of our ability to honor God, to glorify his name, and to put him first in our service and our worship to him. But you know that Satan seeks to disrupt, discourage, and distract our worship. You know, he'd rather you not be here in the first place. He could make a, a thousand reasons why you could be doing something else, why you need to stay home, why you can stay home, and that you should stay home. But yet God 
commands our worship. And he wants us and expects our worship. In Job chapters 1 and 2, I believe he makes it hard on Job. I think the, the, the proof of that is in Job chapter 2. Go back over to Job chapter 2. Notice what it says about how, how Job suffered because of this. When Satan went out of the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sores, boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a pot shirt to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you now hold fast your integrity, curse God, and die? But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women says, Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, Job made this extremely hard for Job. I mean, uh, excuse me, Satan made this extremely hard for Job to concentrate on worship. You know, when you're suffering like that, when you're in situations where there's suffering, and we know all the source of suffering, it's not from God. It's from the devil, isn't it? And so ultimately, he wants us to not even be a part of the worship because of that. Satan truly tries to seek to distract us, disrupt us from worshiping God while we're here. You know what the cares of the world? I put this picture on the chart of a, a little boy perhaps maybe while everybody else is singing he may be daydreaming I, I'm going to put that in the context if I will not to put that boy down but have you ever done that before I have to relate this about my past myself that when I was a young person when I was there uh, going to a particular church there in Kentucky I found it very difficult to listen to sermons and maybe you do too maybe because it I'm not probably not the best speaker in the world. But for me, it's because of the topics. Or maybe the things of the world have such a hold on us that we can't even stop about thinking about fishing or, or bowling or camping or anything else that might be something that we really enjoy. Now, I know there's things we can enjoy in this life. But, you know, our focus should be on what we're doing right now is the most important important thing we should do. You know, true worship requires full concentration and focus. Going back to myself, back when I was a young person, back in my teenage years especially, when the preacher was preaching, I'd be thinking about other things. I'd be like, what am I going to do after services? I'd be thinking about what uh, things I could get into, maybe some video games I could play, things like that. Yeah, you know, young people do sometimes. It's hard sometimes, I know, to focus. Especially when we're talking about the things of God every Sunday. But this is our life, isn't it? It's about what we are, who we are as God's people today. In John chapter 4, 23 and 24, Jesus said, But the hour is coming, he's talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. I mean, that's a very familiar passage. I don't have to really read that, do I? You know, and I know, that we need to put our heart and our mind, that's part about the spirit, and give God the truth and worship Him according to truth. I think that's part of what we do today. But again, we're going to be servants of God. How difficult is it sometimes, especially when you have young kids, especially when you have little babies to watch. And I know young parents have a difficult, sometimes more difficult than others. Or maybe which there's times when I'm preaching that you have some physical ailments, maybe the back and stuff like that are, are hurting. And, and it's hard to listen to someone when that's going on in your life. When you have aches and pains and things that no fault of ourselves is because of who we are and, and sometimes the the things that of life takes us there realize that's it's hard to get full concentration isn't it? but that's hard to do but it's something we do because we love the Lord and the question I have does our mind wander to the things of the world you know what we could do but we need to focus on what we're doing right now and served him. And I think the devil has a part in that because he makes all these other things more appealing in some way. Sometimes kids say, well, church is boring. 
Well, they may say that. You know, things that you really are interested in, things that you really are, are wanting to do more than anything else, they're not boring. <clears throat> if you put your full heart into it, church is not boring. It's the most important thing you could ever do. And I will say this. Does the devil throw so much at us when it comes to physical pains and such and suffering in our lives and temptations and such? That's even hard to be here. Even hard to make it to the sentence. Satan will try to do that because he does not want us to do what we're doing right now in service to God. But we must because we are his people. We are here to glorify. We need to think about that. God's name is not glorified by me if I'm not there in services. I need to be there. We need to keep our hearts. Actually, he wants to keep our hearts from the word. We must keep our hearts on the word of God. You know, Jesus, Jesus told us that, didn't he? That Satan will try to steal the word. Take your Bible to Luke chapter 8, if you will. In Luke chapter 8... Jesus gives us a parable about the sower. He also does in Matthew 13, but also in Mark chapter 4 gives the same, gives the same parable. In Luke chapter 8, Ruins verse 5, he says, The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road. It was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Another seed fell among thorns, and thorns grew up with it and choked it out. And it goes on to talk about this parable. He tells his disciples, it's granted to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Now, what is this idea of the birds taking the seed? So, you know, we can see that picture, how bird-like seed, they will go out and take out the seed. And it never has a chance to get planted in that soil because it's gone. The birds eat it up. Well, Notice what it says in verse, verse 12. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. I think one of the accounts says immediately comes and does that. That's kind of impressive on our minds sometimes that Satan will try to steal the word. Now I think he does a will if we will give attention to other things while the preacher's preaching, maybe like on a cell phone, like the man here on the picture who's there just maybe on his phone while the preacher's preaching. I think that's something that shows distraction when we do things like it, if we do that kind of behavior. Well, why does he do that? Because he knows, Satan knows what the Word of God can do in our lives if we allow it to to work in our lives. First of all, it will increase our faith. The Bible tells Romans 10 verse 17, so the faith comes by what? By hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In other words, when we are listening to God's word, talking about Jesus and, and Paul and, and all the things of the gospel, that ought to increase our faith, build us up when it comes to that. Also, it builds us up, as Acts 20 verse 32 tells us, Paul said, I commend you to the word of of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Again, that also tells us we need to have the word in our life because if you want to be built up and become more spiritual, focus on the word. Don't be distracted by Satan. Don't let him steal the word out of your life because he knows if you stay in it, you can be saved. That's what the last point is. God's word saves us. James 1, 21, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow wickedness and receive with meekness the engrafted word with the implanted word which is able to save your souls. That's why Satan wants to keep our hearts from the word. But he also wants to try to tear up. Once people are following God's word and listening to God's word, you know what the devil tries to do is try to destroy things. Like Satan tried to do his best to start strife there. I want you to think about Job chapter 1 and chapter 2 just for a moment. What purpose the devil, what, what, what purpose do you think he came there to try to do? Try to help people to be more 
godly, more spiritual. No, I believe he was trying to sow discord, trying to spread doubt, trying to do what he can to get people to not really to be faithful to God. That's why he said what he said about Job. You know why that's? Because that's what he does. In John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10, Jesus said to them, Most surely I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, it will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Now here's the part I want to talk about. He says the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I believe the devil is the ultimate thief in this passage in John chapter 10. But he also has others that do the same thing. You know how Satan works today? He works through people today. Satan does not come in this building and say, well, I'm here to destroy everything that you're ever trying to build up here at Meek Street. No, what he does, he uses people who do the same thing to accomplish his will in just that way. I want you to think about for a moment. Can you imagine a world without the devil to upset the unity and harmony of all believers? Imagine if we all got together as believers and, and we ought to be unified in the faith, but yet no one was there to try to tear that up. No one tried to bring in false doctrine. No one tried to say, well, it's my way or the highway kind of thing. Then we'd have true unity. Nobody would argue over the color of the carpet or any other frivolous thing like that and try to tear up the church. But yet, we don't live in that world. We'd have perfect peace, perfect harmony, perfect order, but we don't live in that. It's not now, is it? We see people today who are doing that very work for Satan himself. They come in the church building just like you and I come in the church building. Oftentimes with ulterior motives. Like Paul said about some who, some brethren who, false brethren, who spy out our liberty. Paul's talking about some who are trying to sow discord and, and try to do things and bring strife to the brethren. Do you know God hates that? When people do that. To sow discord. Try to tear up rather than, than build up. Now, it's harder to build up. It's, it's so easy to tear something down. You take a, a stack of blocks. You try to put all those, oh, maybe a house of cards, something, whatever you're trying to build up. It's so easy to just knock that down. It takes a lot longer to build up. Same is true when it comes to God's people in the church. Proverbs 6 says this. Six things the Lord hates, yet, yet seven are abomination to a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devised wicked plans. Feet that are swift and running to evil. A false witness who speaks lies. And last but not least. And one who sows discord among brethren. When somebody's there just to try to be argumentative all the time. Trying to be what? I've got to have my way. That's only discord, isn't it? And maybe we, we forget what that's like. Because that's not what God wants it to be. God wants us to have true unity and a togetherness. Whatever hurts that is showing that people are wanting strife and discord rather than unity. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 28 says this, that a perverse man spreads strife and a slanderer separates intimate friends. And I'll say to make this application of this scripture, it'll separate brethren too, won't it? When somebody's perverse, they're wanting to spread strife and, and all that. And in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, we read this passage already, but verse 5, I want to read it again. It says, about someone who is bringing constant friction between men of depraved mind and depraved of the, deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. In other words, not everybody was really wanting the same goals. They wanted gain. But yet... That's not the goal of the Christian life, is it? In Titus chapter 3, 9 to 11, we see that all playing out in that way. 
Verse 9 says, But avoid controversies and genealogies and strife, disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Worthless. Reject a factious man. Or your translation might have a divisive man after a first and second warning. You know why that's said? Because divisive people can do much damage in the church. Because that's what the devil wants in that way. Notice what it says go on. It says, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. We cannot allow people to, to behave like that in that way. The devil can come to church in that form of someone who wants to tear it. Now, the last part of this lesson, I want to make the application very quickly. What can we do about it? Don't let Satan in our sins. And you might think, well, he's not physically here, is he? Well, we don't not let his ways, not let his sin overtake us, not let into our lives, in other words. Because when we're controlled by the devil by his thinking, his attitudes, his frame of mind of trying to tear up and destroy, we can say, well, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do what the Lord wants. And how do we do that? Don't let it have any influence on our lives. Remember what Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Now, what is this idea, giving place? Well, other translations may have, don't give an opportunity to the devil. In other words, you don't open the door up, even a crack it open just a little bit. Because what happens if you open the door just a little bit, the devil will open up all the way in our lives. That's how we don't let it influence us and keep us doing things that are wrong and sinful in our, in our lives today. And we must continue to resist and reject those who are working for him. When the devil comes to services, he wants to do what's wrong. We have to resist that, don't we? Paul would say to Timothy, the young preacher would say, I want this last verse of the lesson. St. Timothy chapter 2, 25 and 26. How that we in humility are to correct those, correcting those who are in opposition if God <coughs> perhaps will grant them repentance so they will may know the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been captive or taken captive by him to do his will. That's how sometimes Satan comes to church in that form of people who are captive to do his will. But we don't have to put up with that, do we? That's one reason why God says to practice church discipline when it comes to divisive people and to, to simply stay the course and serve God in the right way. Hope this lesson has been beneficial in some way. That we realize that Satan is out there. We don't have to give in to him. We can resist him. We can serve God. And one day be saved for our own eternity. If you obey the gospel by faith, by repentance of your sins, by confession of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and baptism for the remission of your sins. Like Acts 2 verse 38 tells us, it's for the remission of your sins. You can be saved today. If you need to respond to the gospel call of salvation, why don't you come? Because together we stand and we sing the song that's been selected.